and welcome to Web of Light. I'm Dr. Kevin, and we are here yet again to take you on a journey of those people that are weaving a web of light in the world. Uh, you may be watching us from Idaho, Iowa, California, Maine, Florida. We are all across the U.S. through the public access system. If you've recently joined us, we'd love to hear from you and welcome you to our Web of Light family. Uh, you can reach out to me at Dr. Kevin, D-R-K-E-V-I-N, at mydrkevin.com or at weboflight.com, either one. Uh, let us know that you've joined our Web of Light family, and feel free to suggest topics you'd like to see us cover or people you'd like to see us interview. Um, now, they might have to come to the greater Hudson, Nashua, New Hampshire area, but hey, if they're willing to show up, we're willing to interview them. Uh, my guest host for the month is Cheryl Burns. Hey, Cheryl. Hello. Good to be here. We, you know, we, we love having you. You have uh, Tangled Roots Herbal mm -hmm. in Nashua, New Hampshire. She's a certified herbalist uh, and full-time troublemaker. Yes, unfortunately yes. that's true. Yes, I know that. <laughs> uh, you've been on s several of our shows as a guest. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're really loving having you here as our co-host. Well, thank you. And because I know all of your areas of expertise, I have decided that I wanted us to take a couple of minutes and talk about this incoming tax plan because I'm sure that you have studied it thoroughly, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think that one of the things, one of the reasons I wanted to chat about it is because it's been really touted to help small businesses. You're a small business owner. I'm a small yeah. business owner. Um, but the way that they define small businesses that it's going to help uh, are a million dollars a year or more. Now, you fall in that category, right? Oh, of course. Yeah, so do I. I mean, we are the backbone of America, <laughs> which is under a million dollars a year, small business. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, somehow we're not getting helped as much as they said. No. No. Yeah. I'm, I'm finding that this whole trickle-down economics thing is... Um, somehow not helping the middle class a whole lot. It's certainly not helping the states. Okay? Yeah. And uh, it's not helping the small business that I like to think of as small business, which is the person that's out there living their dream or passion. Right. So, I don't know. What do you think? Are we getting a snow job? Could be. Could be. Um, I wanted to also talk about that because there is, you know, they talk about the trickle-down effect, mm -hmm. but one of the trickle-down effects is when they move more of the burden to the state and temporarily compensate, states then start tightening their budgets. One of the areas that get, get really affected by that um, are state-supported programs mm -hmm. and nonprofits that the states uh, are supporting. Uh, looking at today's guest, um, I, I was wondering how they were maybe feeling about uh, the fact that there's probably some funding that's getting ready to go away. Yeah, probably not feeling too good about that. You know, we, we try to remember to give during the Christmas season, mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of people out there that need us that don't go away January 2nd. That's right. That seems to happen every year, right? We're in such a it's so prevalent during the holiday season. And then after that, it seems we get back into our routine of things and we just, I don't know, do we forget about it or, or what have you, but, but things are needed throughout the entire year. People need help all year long. And you know, being here at, uh, in one of the coldest winters we've had ever, um, I don't think that Santa gave all those homeless people homes for Christmas. I don't think they fit in the stockings. No, I don't think so. Uh, I'm going to introduce today's guest. We have a couple of them on. One is a returning guest, uh, and uh, that would be Jay Gupta, who is the director of uh, pharmacy and integrative health for Harbor Homes, the founder of Yoga Caps, uh, and also has been a, an integrative health pharmacist and yoga practitioner and been doing work with Crossing the Both uh, since the 80s. Jay, welcome back. Thank you. And uh, Jay has bought one of his partners in crime, Peter Kelleher, who is the CEO and president 
uh, of the Partnership for Successful Living member agencies. Provi he provides strategic visioning, development, and oversight for more than 80 programs, comprising a $24 million plus operating budget, proposal development resulting in approximately $130 million in, dollars in grants, and an oversight of 320 management and direct care professionals. Uh, Mr. Kelleher received his BA uh, degree in psychology from Clark University and his master's in social work degree from Simmons College School of Social Work. He has more than 40 years of experience in the field of uh, health and human services, nonprofit management, low income housing, and facility development. P Peter began his current career at Harbor Homes as the agency's first employee in 1982. Peter, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Kevin. So, Peter, how, you know, do you think there will be an impact to the support that you're getting from the state because of this tax? It's a little too early to tell for sure, but you definitely have to be concerned, anxious, worry, uh, whenever a part of your budget's dependent on local or state and uh, federal dollars. And it seems clear that there will be a shift uh, onto local governments. Uh, where some of the federal dollars are, are being uh, cut back and, and tightened, and it may be uh, putting more pressure on state governments as individual taxpayers will uh, be able to deduct a, a capped amount of, of money every year uh, in terms of um, deductions. And so I, I, I do think that governments will be under pressure and uh, individual taxpayers will be as well. You know, some people have looked at this, and I want to get into all the great work that Partnership is doing and things like that, but some people have looked at this as if the move in Washington was, in many cases, uh, to punish the non-voters because, let's face it, I, you know, you've worked with the homeless population for a long time. I suspect many of them are not registered to vote. It's difficult. If not although, nearly impossible. Yes, although we do uh, a great deal in terms of uh, encouraging access to voter, voting and registration and transportation to voting, uh, there are quite a few folks that just are unable to or maybe their disability is such that they can't uh, or they're just uh, really uninterested and disenfranchised. Um, Jay, do you <laughs> find that a lot of times the, the population that you work with through the pharmacy and through the work that you do with yoga um, leads to people not being able to be, they, they can't afford energy wise, mental facility wise, um, even focus wise to be franchised in a system that, that has become so complicated and distant from the common man? Well, we see it all the time, but that's <coughs> what is the most exciting part of my current life is right now, that when they come to pharmacy, they cannot afford the medicine, uh, we provide access to them. Uh, whether it is counseling about the medication, just discussing about the medication, sometimes people take the medicine if their insurance pays for it, but they're not able to uh, deal with the side effects. They don't want to hurt the doctor's feelings, the pharmacist's feelings. They don't want to talk about it. They would talk to me right now. That helps them understand why they're taking this medication and how do we minimize the side effects of the medicine. Cost is another barrier, which we talked about previously. Uh, so because we have a sliding scale system, if people have insurance, definitely we build the insurance company. We can't waive the co-pays off. That's a legal requirement. But we definitely help them. Uh, as much as we can, providing them access to the medications. And for those of you who did not um, see the individual show that we did with Jay, you definitely uh, want to either catch it uh, in a replay on Hudson Access or you can go to YouTube, the My Dr. Kevin channel, uh, and watch it uh, because there's a lot of fascinating things you're doing. And through your work with Harbor Homes and outside of Harbor Homes, um, giving people things that they can do that you're making available and affordable besides medication to also deal with their issues. So there are a lot of healing modalities. So what we discussed was yoga. 
<coughs> we made enormous collection of practices and how people can get easy access to that those yoga practices so they can we can minimize some prescription burden the whole healthcare cost right now is escalating because the cost of medicines keep going up cost of entire healthcare system is going up so personally i feel where we can make a lot of differences people take responsibility for their own health we give them support when they need the support learn those techniques and maybe they won't need some of those medications so that will be a direct impact on healthcare system and health of people oh, one of the things that uh, we're going to get to in a minute is actually an interview uh, that I was doing with Peter at their location on High Street where he explains about each of the partnerships uh, and he has this beautiful logo I love the logo of the tree mm -hmm. um, and the coming together and the entwining um, and the support that happens through the various agencies involved in there I do want to apologize to my viewers because it was a very narrow hallway. It was a very busy day. Um, so you're going to see some quality differences. Uh, believe it or not, we actually, the only way we could get footage for you uh, in that hallway was on my iPhone. So, uh, but I think that it was such a powerful visual of how those agencies work together that we are uh, going to be cutting to that in just a minute, not quite yet. but. Uh, I did want to give you a heads up because you're going to see a, it's almost like the Wizard of Oz when she goes from black and white to color. You can be like, wah, huh, huh? <laughs> but we couldn't even set the cameraman up because the hallway was too narrow, if you remember, Peter. Absolutely. Um, you started Harbor Homes, correct? It says you're, you were the first employee. Did I you? was the first employee in 1982, but I work for a board that was in existence that was just starting to get launched the agency. Okay. And um, I did not start it though, but uh, oh, okay. I, I was hired. The first program that we operated was working with folks who had serious mental illness and uh, helping to provide them with a stable home in the community. I'm gonna ask your, your learned opinion on something, um, and this could open up a whole can of worms and I don't wanna get distracted by it. But we were talking about, you know, voting, and uh, obviously oftentimes people with mental health issues um, can't always know what would be voting in their best interest. Um, do you think that their vote should be assigned to people that are their caretakers to be able to vote for them to be protected? Jay is laughing, so I may have just <laughs> put my foot into something. It was a thought that, uh, that just crossed my mind, and I, I kind of go with it. Peter, why is Jay uh, laughing? <laughs> well, he may have a variety of reasons, but, uh, <laughs> you know, serious mental illness is generally a brain disease, and uh, there's a great deal of stigma with it, uh, but people are able to recover and live and function and be responsible citizens in the community, and they, they ought to have the right to vote just like any other citizen, uh, and for the most part, do vote. So they're... they're participating and uh, in some cases leading as members of our community. So that put me in my place. <laughs> I the thought just crossed my mind because we had been talking about, you know, that if you have a disenfranchised population, do they not get as represented well if they don't have voices? Mm -hmm. So I, they, I want... they, they need to have a voice. Yes. Yeah. Uh, especially these days where the state is um, considering whether or not to continue the Medicaid expansion program, as it's known. Uh, and as you talked about the federal issues that are changing, there's a dynamic that could impact that here in New Hampshire. But this program and the ability to have access to health insurance uh, is life-saving for many of the folks that we work with, uh, especially those that are recovering in the or are trying to get treatment in the opioid crisis that the state faces right now. So it is um, absolutely vital that they have continued access to that insurance and we hope that the, the federal things uh, don't push it off course. You are doing some impressive things through partnership of successful, for successful living um, around the opioid crisis in this area. Can you share a little bit of what you're doing here that's helping with that? Sure. 
So our agencies are involved in uh, the opioid crisis in several ways. We first operate a statewide addiction crisis line, and uh, you know that's uh, available for people to call. Uh, and I hope you don't ask me the number off the top of my head, but uh, it is on the web if you type in State Addiction Crisis Line for New Hampshire. Uh, and 24-7, we have staff that are serving anyone in New Hampshire, including folks from Hudson, that uh, are trying to find out what's out there. What exists for care? What are the p possible ways that I could get care? What can I afford? Uh, and, um, you know, how can I get recovery? And those are, are great resources, the people that, that work that. So that's one way. Another way, uh, we operate a residential treatment facility for people who are um, needing longer-term services and basically live uh, and receive treatment while they're there. Uh, and part of that is also a program for women and their children uh, where people, mothers uh, and their children can stay right with them as they receive treatment to try to keep the family together. Um, so that's, that's another major part of what we do. And we offer uh, something called medication-assisted treatment, which is um, kind of very uh, promising practices where people are prescribed things such as Vivitrol and Suboxone that have helped uh, longer term with solutions out of the opioid crisis. And last, I'll just mention the biggest thing that we're working on these days is something called Safe Station. It is uh, a partnership between ourselves and uh, the mayor, the city of Nashua Fire Department, and the ambulance department uh, that's in, in Nashua. Uh, and uh, basically, it's a, a, a pathway all about access where people can, um, if you're in the middle of uh, an opiate addiction, or any other kind of substance use addiction, and you're in that magic moment where you're saying, yeah, I'm ready, I wanna have some help. You can go to any one of the fire station locations, uh, seven locations in the city of Nashua, 24 hours a day, and ask for help. And in the 13 months that we've been operating the program, we've had 1,200 people who have accessed uh, the program, and about 50 have been from Hudson. So you don't have to be a Nashua resident. You could live in Hudson or you could live in Merrimack or whatever. But if you walk into a Nashua fire station and go, help, I, I, I need help to clear this addiction, mm -hmm. somebody from Partnership for Successful Living is there to support you through that process. Right. So what happens next, uh, Dr. Kevin, is that... Uh, the ambulance uh, department will go to the fire station that someone arrives at and uh, just check them out medically and make sure that they're cleared and safe to come to Harbor Homes or whether they need to go to an emergency department. And uh, about 90% of the folks go to Harbor Homes, so within about uh, 11 minutes or so, our staff are there at the fire station. We pick them up and transport them to a safe Harbor Homes location where they're able to uh, be assessed for what it is that they may need. Uh, you know, are they somebody that is in the middle and, the, and that they need to have medical detox? That's something that we also provide. So, uh, you know, is, do they need residential? Do they need individual? Do they need intensive outpatient groups? Uh, so we try to assess that and figure out what's the best, best pathway to offer to somebody to further the journey of recovery. 11 minutes. That's some impressive. What do you think? Very. Uh, if uh, th that, that person comes in and they go through this process uh, in-house, then you also have post-care programs as well. We mm -hmm. talked about those a little bit, yeah. um, but could you address that a little bit? Because the opioid crisis is huge in this area. Mm -hmm. Uh, throughout the state of New Hampshire um, and so sure and I'll just follow up on the 11 minutes if I might by saying we we know it's 11 minutes because the fire departments track that very carefully and in that during that 11 minutes it actually shuts that fire station down from further receiving or responding to a fire call so it's critical that we be there uh, quickly and uh, responsibly would you uh, do you see a vision of spreading this throughout the state? 
I do. I think it's a best practice that uh, will be uh, sort of modeled in other parts of, this, of the country. Uh, we've heard from Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, they've come up, visited, approached us, and they just recently, a couple weeks ago, announced the, the initiation of their own safe station program. So other fire departments are looking at it carefully, and I think it's going to uh, really be uh, more prevalent throughout the country as time goes on, and, and the data that supports its effectiveness uh, begins to get better compiled. Okay. It's just if I might, for example, uh, in the Nashua area in the first year, we've had about a 20% reduction in the number of overdoses that have occurred uh, since starting the Safe Station program, and it's with that first 1,200 people. You, and you may not know the statistic, but Nashua has seen a 20% decrease because of this Safe Station program. Overall, has the state seen a decrease or an increase in the last year? Do you know? It's been flat statewide. Flat statewide. Right. Just for this most, since about 2012, there's been an increase every single year. So over the last uh, four or five years, it's increase, increase. And then this last year, it's kind of peaked out. And there's been some projections that it might slightly decline in terms of fatalities and overdoses in the next year. Yeah, well, 20% is a little more than slight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely much lower than the state numbers. Yes. Uh, and to a big part, I'm sure because of this program. Well, it's a partnership. All these amazing people, uh, you know, just have come together and... Uh, you know, it's, it's been a huge lift for us as an organization to figure out on a 24-hour basis to make all these pieces come together. And uh, it's about access, you know, access. Uh, you know, normally accessing these kinds of services would take somebody six months to 18 months to put together. And uh, a fair amount of those people would be dead before they could get through that whole process. Yeah. Yes. A very significant percentage of folks with uh, SUD don't ever really get treatment. It's about 80 percent. Okay. And we have to provide 24-7 care with the medical respite, where we have 11 right. beds right now. Yeah. So, but you, uh, we all know you can get through the, the in-house program, you can get through the respite, you can kind of start to get turned around. But then you go out into the world, you've changed, the world hasn't. And through the Partnership of Successful Living and the various agencies you have, you continue to offer support how? Well, folks might complete residential treatment services and, or they might, in an ongoing way, receive uh, various kinds of treatment. Uh, could be what we call partial hospitalization or it could be intensive outpatient. And when someone's kind of solidly back on their journey of recovery, we try to connect them up with the local recovery organization in the greater Nashua area. That organization's called Revive Recovery, and they're on Main Street in Nashua, right near the hospital. Uh, and um, we also try to figure out, are there gaps where people uh, don't have the housing stabilities. We very much see housing as a, a critical ingredient to somebody's long-term success and bedrock to, you know, living a, a successful life. Uh, so we try to find ways to support somebody in affordable, safe housing that's um, kind of not going to return them to an environment where they're going to be at a high risk to relapse. Now, Harbor Homes is the agency that ad addresses homes for, for people that are homeless or need assistance in housing. Mm -hmm. How many units are you currently, uh, and what's the area coverage? Across the state of New Hampshire, at this point, we have about 1,000 units of housing that we're involved in supporting one way or another. Um, and, you know, usually the most, most of the, the housing that we're involved in is in the southern part of the state. Okay. So you have housing in Hudson, Nashua, this whole area? 
We have apartments that we lease or we subsidize uh, somebody that may need some support. Uh, and they, they could be anywhere from the northern part of New Hampshire to, to Nashua. Okay, so I'm going to uh, say, if I have somebody out here that's watching this right now, and let's say that they're somebody who is, is older, maybe is moving into a place of where they're going to go into either an assisted living or they're really going to downsize, they're looking for some uh, tax breaks or things like that. Can people literally leave you guys as a tax, as a, as a charitable donation? Could they leave you their condo or their house for you to use for these purposes? They absolutely could. Yes, in fact. It's a tax deductible donation. Yes. Being a 501c3 nonprofit. And folks have, in fact, done that on uh, some limited occasions. Yeah. Well, it, you know, I think that there are people out there who may be, you know, I don't have any kids or my kids are all really established in another part of the world. They don't care. I have this place and I'd like to, I'd like it to have some value. I'd like to leave a legacy or I'd like to do something. And they might never think that they could actually do that and it could help them with some, some difficult tax things. We'd be thrilled if someone were to w want to go on that course with us. Uh, you have so many people that are just um, in dire straits that uh, aren't able to get access to stable housing. Sometimes they have children in their family and we, we see uh, all of the different effects that can come out of that. Well, certainly it, it, when we're talking about families and we're talking about children who may go through periods of sleeping in cars or on, you know, whatever couches they can find or shelters that, you know, that in, impacts the whole future, that, that whole, that whole sure. future generation yeah. of people that, you know, do everything from physical issues that can come out for lack of nutrition and things like this to the mental emotional okay. impacts to the sense of self. Um, and I, I don't, you know, I, I like the, that Native American that, you know, you want to think about any action you take and how it's going to affect the next seven generations. Yep. Um, and I think that we don't think enough of that today oftentimes, how much the generational impact is going Th to be. There is a generational impact. And um, sadly, we, we do from time to time see where um, various uh, sons, grandsons, can, granddaughters, uh, you know, may end up needing services from us where in years past we had to provide similar services to another generation. Um, but I wanted to just get across that these are real people that, you know, we're serving. Last night there were 24 persons, men and women, that were in our emergency shelter in, in Nashua. And, um, you know, they have no other place to go with these kinds of temperatures that are out there, especially in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I don't know what they would be doing if, if uh, they didn't have a place like this to go to. What are some other things people can do to help support what you guys do in your mission, whether that's with homelessness or addiction, you know, someone who can't leave a home, let's mm -hmm. say, because it is the small acts that all add up as well. Absolutely. Um, so we welcome volunteers that may want to assist us in any way. Uh, we have uh, a fundraising event coming up to support the Safe Station program that I just talked about a few moments ago um, on the uh, morning of Valentine's Day uh, in February the 14th. Uh, that we would welcome any help that people might want to give us for that event. Um, Including showing up and eating pancakes. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Who doesn't love to do that? Yes. <laughs> and this is especially a uh, significant event in that we're honoring um, the fire chief of Nashua, Steve Gallipole, that's been there for 40 years serving the community. And we're sure there are other firefighters and Hudson that know and respect uh, his work. Uh, so we really want to, uh, we're grateful that he's given us the opportunity to honor him and uh, 
we think that uh, others will, will want to honor that service as well. It's, he's been an amazing partner for us in this whole Safe Station initiative. He had the courage to uh, you know, lead the department in this direction, and I'm sure that that wasn't um, always an easy thing for anyone to have that, that courage. So, uh, Valentine's morning, yes. where is this happening? Uh, that's happening at the Marriott uh, in Nashua. Courtyard Marriott? Yes. Okay. So there'll be a fundraising, uh, it's a fundraising yes. event. Yes, and if you go to our website, uh, we'll be happy to share any of the details. Uh, and just also to get back to your question, of course, anybody that wanted to support our organization uh, financially, we would be most grateful as we have had significant challenges in keeping the Safe Station program going. That's, that's really what this fundraiser is going to benefit, to keep the Safe Station program on course. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very significant in the uh, financial commitment that it requires to keep all of this happening 24-7, operating uh, you know, the 11 bet beds of detox have nursing staff and so forth. Uh, it's uh, substantial. Well, I, I'm certainly happy myself to put whatever information through all my different social media yeah. and get it out there and share it with who I can share it with here. Um, again, because this is a nonprofit and it's a fundraiser for something benefiting the local community. Um, I know that the, the station will, is willing to have us mention it. I know somebody who has a, a retail store in downtown oh, Nashville. I bet she would yeah, bet she'd put a flyer up in <laughs> her window put for you. Put a flyer up. We can put it out in our newsletter, yes. through Facebook. And, um, and we're hoping businesses will want to sponsor this event as well. Lots of opportunities uh, still available for that. Great. So, so I have a million dollar question for you about that pancake breakfast, which I have to say I'm going to have to miss because it's a long flight in from Curacao and I'm on my honeymoon that week. Well, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, when, when I discovered Friday what the actual date was because I was uh, uh, talking, uh, was talking to Mike on Friday, somebody who uh, works for Peter, uh, and he was like, Valentine's Day. I'm like, I'm I'm out of town that week. What day of the week is it. that on? It's a Wednesday. It's a Wednesday. Okay. Are you going to have gluten-free pancakes for those of us who are, who are gluten -free? I understand we are. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. get, you know, got to put it out there. Yep. Um, Very important. It's, it's all about uh, health and, uh, you know, gluten-free is a very much a growing and important health, health strategy. Now, uh, so you started with Harbor Homes, and you know I, I know that we can't even uh, scrape the surface really of all of the great stuff you've done since then. Um, but you, when did you start collecting agencies? When did you start <laughs> to get the idea of Partnership for <laughs> Successful Living? Well, I think. Um, <laughs> It's, it's a good question. Uh, I don't know that we collected agencies and just opportunities presented themselves is kind of how I remember it. And that, uh, you know, we had folks that, uh, other nonprofits that we work closely with and saw that um, we did similar things. And um, we thought, you know, could it be that we could do them better if we were sort of all under one roof working as close partners. And so agencies approached us and said, would you consider this? And so over time, we ended up with six agencies. Three we, uh, were, were created and three that came about as kind of mergers of our boards. And uh, it's really, it's pro if you know anything about kind of the nonprofit world and how people access services, uh, it's a much more efficient um, sort of process than say here's a referral to six agencies best of luck trying to get get there and uh, get whatever it is that you might need and uh, you know this way people can improve their access in a faster and more efficient way it's like you have an internal concierge 
<laughs> so let me, so we, we need you to go from Harbor Homes to Keystone Hall. Here, let me walk you down and introduce you to the person because they're right down the, or they're right down the hallway or Absolutely. whatever. We, we call it warm handoff. Yeah. In the healthcare system, the coordination of care is very, very critical. And I think by putting all the agencies together, Peter very successfully, I think, brought that into practice for our national residents. Easy. And, and I th think that, you know, there, is, there are <coughs> some people um, who will try to manipulate or play agencies when they're all separate and may double dip or do things that, uh, and, and it's a survival mode for some people. Um, but it also is like the person who goes to four different doctors and then gets four different kinds of medication and fulfills them at three different pharmacies. So nobody knows what's going on until it turns into a crisis. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm assuming that there's an internal communication that goes on when a client is shared to, um, you know, help with that sort of thing. It also must be more financially efficient to have some things not be repeated and things like that. So more dollars can go to services and less go to administrative. It, it uh, absolutely reduces duplication of service and it facilitates kind of the administration across finance and technology um, and many other ways where you can sort of uh, take advantage of efficiencies. You mentioned a warm handoff um, a couple of times, and, and I love that term. And I would imagine that that impacts your retention of people as well, because when you're in that place of crisis, whatever it may be, you're, it, it's, you gotta hit it hot. And when you move to the next phase, people can fall between the cracks. Absolutely. And they're not gently handed off to the next place for the next step, so. That's a great point. And the way we kind of think about it is though we have sort of a braided relationship with people. Uh, you know, the typical nonprofit, say, might have a relationship with one strand where we might have five or six, which results in a stronger bond and a, a greater likelihood that some of them will adhere over time. Um, you know, if you're going to a nonprofit and you only get, say, food or shelter from that one nonprofit, uh, you might have a different relationship with one that you really had, you know, some health care, some oral health care, uh, or maybe some substance use disorder treatment, or maybe you were accessing stable housing, um, that there's a, a much better chance that uh, it's more effective over the long term. That's, that's really what we're trying to do is create a structure that someone will have more of a profound and sustain, sustained impact on their life than uh, what you might see just from that single purpose access. We're gonna take a moment and we're gonna actually have, uh, we're gonna show you some footage that I taped of Peter um, explaining each of the agencies against that beautiful tree that they have on that wall in that narrow hallway. Uh, <laughs> um, we'll widen it up for you. <laughs> I'm working on that. <laughs> Trust me. Um, so we're going to cut to that so that Peter can kind of go over uh, all of the different agencies. And uh, then when we come back, I've got some more questions for Peter and Jay. Hello, Dr. Kevin here. Welcome to another edition of Web of Light. I am here today at Partnership for Successful Living with Peter Kelleher. You have one of the most unique models I've ever seen for overall helping a community. And I'd like to have, Peter, I'd like to have you, he's, he's our, the executive director here. Can you give us a little bit of, like, what is this beautiful tree and what is it doing for the state of New Hampshire? So thank you. We, what we try to do is look at the whole person and try to figure out across issues of mental health, physical health, recovery, employment, education, and housing, how do you get all the resources together so somebody can live a completely successful life? That's why we're called the Partnership for Successful Living. Now, the partnership, so, I mean, I've been working in and out of the nonprofit world for years. I used to actually uh, work with community services and stuff like that. And 
Are there a lot of places like this out there in the country now? Because this is definitely a new concept from when I was involved with this, the, you know, this uh, uh, process. And we have a unique model, which is uh, where six different nonprofits all bring their collective resources together with the same board and the same CEO who try to basically what we call the red carpet uh, treatment uh, service where if one uh, representative from our agency is calling on behalf of a client that it's expected that uh, no matter where you are in the partnership that you uh, kind of make your make that a priority and uh, try to find a way to facilitate as reasonable as possible uh, a quick efficient access to the service. Now um, I know that we've done some other footage that will get dropped in here and there but you have Keystone Hall, uh, Harbor Homes, Healthy at Home, Welcoming Light, Milford Regional Counseling Services, and the Southern New Hampshire HIV AIDS Task Force. What has been the most recent addition? Uh, the most recent addition uh, would be uh, Healthy at Home. Healthy at Home. Yes. And that's about 15 years ago at this point. Okay. Okay. So do you think that if... Uh, do you see any place where you would go, I would love to get a nonprofit that I think would help build this tree even better or, or something? If you could wave a wand, what would be the next line underneath that? Uh, I, I think that we pretty much have the right uh, synergy of focus okay. uh, and have the right people on the bus at this point. We have had others who have actually approached us to sort of uh, join in, but we think for the people that we're focused on working with, which are people who are uh, vulnerable and complex and have difficult challenges accessing uh, the array of uh, web uh, of services, uh, you know, it's the right fit. Okay. So now I'm just going to have you do a, a quick, uh, again, you, you did a much fuller one and we're going to be dropping sure. some of that in, but we have Milford Regional Counseling Services mm -hmm. and can you give me sure. a... Milford Regional is a, uh, a small nonprofit uh, providing behavioral health services in Milford and uh, just as a, a small staff of clinical uh, professionals that are able to work with lower income people in the Milford area who just don't have any other like services uh, out in, in that area. And Milford also provides an, a, a great deal of services and support across the other partnership agencies. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much you can tell looking at it here. I love this logo. I fell in love with it the first time I saw it because you see how it all entwines. Like this is, this is like everything is touching and affecting everything else. New Hampshire, uh, Southern New Hampshire uh, AIDS Task Force. Yes, so the task force provides medical case management to about 200 uh, persons that struggle with HIV and AIDS, both here in Nashua and in Keene. And it's a great example of an agency uh, where that, that can take advantage of all of the different services across the partnership. As folks that utilize the task force services also often need to have, uh, say, access to medical health care services that might be available in harbor homes, or housing services that might be available in harbor homes, or even home care services through Healthy at Home. And uh, sometimes they also need substance use disorder treatment services that would be available through Keystone. And uh, again, the, the task force actually has a uh, food pantry. They do. Um, you know, it's, it's oftentimes when we think of people that are being disenfranchised because of health issues or mental or emotional issues, we take for granted all of the things that we do that is really an issue for them or maybe beyond because all of their income has been suck dry for medical care and you know we all know what a disaster insurance is these days and so we don't stop and think you know not only do they need a roof over their head but they need food in their stomach and they need their medication if they're going to live and this is part of why I love love all of this and the support system to stay healthy so that's Greater National Council on Alcoholism mm -hmm. um, Healthy at Home, tell us a little bit about that Healthy at Home is a Medicare certified home health agency, much like a visiting nurse association, but they have a specialty in that they serve folks that have behavioral health disorders uh, and complex people 
like those that we might serve across the partnership that have multiple needs at the same time. Okay. So, oh, now Medicare still exists? I thought they were trying to get rid of that. <laughs> no, I think, uh, yeah. It exists today, right? So, as, as far as uh, we know, it'll be around for a little bit of time, but yes, there's been a lot of conversation, and truthfully, nobody knows where the healthcare world is going, and that's actually a reason to kind of uh, connect with somebody, an entity like this that has sort of a full service approach. Welcoming Light, Inc. Tell us a little bit about that one. Welcoming Light is dedicated to providing employment and educational services for our clients, our staff, and the community. Okay, so um, when you say educational services, what kind of educational services are you talking it about? It could be uh, training services so that a client can be qualified to be employed in a particular job. It could be uh, ongoing training and professional education for, say, our physicians or nurses. Uh, that need that in order to uh, sort of be on the cutting edge of their professional domains. Okay, and then lastly over here we have Harbor Homes. And yes. you have how many Harbor Homes that you're offering out there to people? Harbor Homes now has over a thousand units of housing all across the state of New Hampshire. And uh, we really see housing as bedrock to somebody's ongoing success. It's a key determinant to somebody's health, a social determinant of health if you will and uh, just critical to have uh, a place that's safe and affordable for somebody to uh, go home to at night. Okay, Peter, I want to talk to you. We're going to pull a couple of chairs right up here. All right, we for can For you that. and I, and uh, sit down for a second, because you've had some exciting stuff going on, and you know, one of the questions I wanted to talk to you about is, People that have heard for, about the Partnership for Successful Living, what do you think would be two or three of the things that would be most surprised that you're involved with? Well, I think uh, first people would be very surprised that we provide extensive uh, oral health services and that we have a, a full professional dental health clinic here where people can access it at uh, a sliding fee scale. Uh, and. Um, we have three dentists, three hygienists, and two dental assistants. So that's a very popular thing that we do. And so I just want to have it noted that when we were going through the tour and we took some pictures, we didn't get any film of the actual dental clinic, but uh, I saw it. I was asked if I needed any work done on my teeth. Um, I think it was, if this interview goes well, I'm going to use Novocaine, and if it didn't, I think I'm doing it without, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what else? <laughs> so the other thing that, we do two other things that people are just learning about because it's relatively new. We now offer a sort of Winnebago size uh, van that we call Integrated Care on Wheels where people can access uh, dental health services as well as medical and behavioral health services. And there are two dental operatories in it and uh, just an amazing resource that can travel to where the need is in the greater Nashua area. You know, and I'm gonna take a second and share a little uh, story with you because you know, a lot of times people, dental care is something that gets written out early in, a, in the process when money gets tight, when services aren't available, and, um, and people don't realize that bad teeth and bad dental care can create other major health problems. Um, and uh, back in 2013, I actually uh, ended up with a heart virus. And at the end of my, uh, after a week in the hospital, when they finally figured out what was going on, um, I only had uh, like 12 or 13% of my heart working. Wow. And when they, when I got, finally got with a, with a good doctor, and I use that term specifically, um, his number one uh, best guess, because that's all they could do, uh, was it was from a filling that had gone bad in my tooth that created the heart virus. So, you know, it may be easy to think, oh, you know, I can't afford health care, I don't want health care, you know, I'm not health care, dental care, that, you know, stuff like this, but it, it can kill you. It can, and there are so many other ways that other kinds of uh, conditions connect to oral health. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're involved in behavioral health uh, challenges or you have a substance use disorder, uh, so many of the time, or you know, in people's lives, that you know, it could be that uh, 
an underlying oral health, uh, untreated condition could be causing some behavioral health. You know, and that's why in our integrated care model, we do what's called uh, a morning huddle where a dentist and a psychiatrist interact together, stand, sort of standing in a circle where all of our professionals are together, and they share information to look at the person as a whole across the different areas of expertise. And I asked you for three, and the third would be? The third one is called mobile crisis response. So the greater Nashua area is um, sort of, um, is, is being blessed in that we have a brand new program that started July 1st where 24 professionals have been hired to uh, be available seven days a week, 24 hours a day to perform something called mobile crisis response where anywhere in the greater Nashua area that if someone is experiencing a behavioral health crisis they'll be able to go to that person or their family and try to see what they can do to remedy the situation to uh, sort of lessen the severity of the crisis and at the same time that program can offer uh, we have four crisis apartments where people could stay for up to seven days or even longer sometimes so that the crisis could be uh, more properly addressed and we could give support to somebody as they try to get through their crisis. Now one of the things I saw downstairs uh, as we were looking around here we're at 45 High Street yeah. Um, at the, uh, I think it's called the Harbor Home Health Clinic, is it? Okay? Harbor Care Health and Wellness Center. It's health and Wellness Center. Um, is you also have a medical respite, and I'm not going to remember the, the full name of it, sorry. The Gilmore Medical Respite Center. Okay. I never watched the Gilmore Girls, so I had nothing to like. <laughs> like this is it. named after Peggy and David <laughs> Gilmore, who are amazing people in the greater Nashua area. That, uh, um, so, uh, so, Talk, talk in a second about this medical respite. Sure. So medical respite is a service that uh, is offered by federally qualified health centers in other parts of the country in about 200 locations, but this is New Hampshire's first uh, sort of foray into this issue. And it's 11 beds. It's a place where people can stay overnight uh, and receive nursing support and other uh, behavioral health support. Generally, we've used it often for medical detox for people who are experiencing a crisis uh, in the opioid. I'm interested in, first of all, uh, just a quick rundown of what were the next two agencies you acquired that, that came into you? You started with Harbor Homes, and what came in next? Uh, the first agency was called Milford Regional Counseling Services. Okay. And uh, that was in the early 90s where we had a board member that was the director of that agency and wanted to find a place that uh, it would have sort of safekeeping. And as this board member at the time was in uh, frail health and was very concerned and just completely dedicated uh, to sustaining that agency in, in the mission. So uh, our board was asked and we uh, have sustained it to this day. So it's, that was the very first. And it's a small counseling agency in Milford where there aren't a lot of local services that are available at an affordable rate for counseling. And so it's small and that's, that's pretty much the core of what they do out there. And I know that they also come in and offer services to other people within the, and that are involved in other agencies they in do. the partnership as well. Yes. Um, so for example, um, you know, the, they provide clinical supervision and they provide training to other staff in the partnership and they have uh, expertise in providing b behavioral health services for people with HIV and AIDS, which is one of our other agencies. So what was, this, what was the next one that came in? Uh, the next agency was called Keystone Hall, which is a substance use disorder uh, treatment agency. Uh, where there was a, a director at the time that uh, just sort of made that point that I made earlier about doing it better serving people by working together. Uh, and um, since we've been involved with the agency, it's kind of quadrupled in size and complexity. And uh, I bet you have that effect on things. <laughs> 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 
Well, it's been a remarkable journey, I'll tell you. <laughs> that, uh, Not in people, on organizations. No, organizations. <laughs> so we don't want people to be caught up in. Yeah, we've had mostly years of growth in the 35 years I've been here. It's been remarkable, very fulfilling. But yes, Keystone Hall was um, the next agency. And then you acquired one more? After that, the Southern New Hampshire HIV AIDS Task Force. Um, also uh, was an agency that we'd been working very closely together. Um, there was a desire to have more access to housing services for the clients that were served by that agency, and we had already been doing it. Uh, and the agency at the time was kind of in a uh, frail f fiscal uh, status, and we were able to kind of come in and sort of shore them up and ensure that uh, things got put in uh, a better place financially, and it's been doing fantastic ever since. And then you said you created three, no, two more agencies, it must have been. Well, Harbor Homes was created as yeah, the yeah. first, and then Healthy at Home, which was a Medicare-certified home health agency that we created, uh, and that was done in order to gain more access to home health care services for those that we serve. Uh, it was very difficult. Um, with uh, the resources that were available at the time for uh, persons with serious mental illness to have home health care workers come into their home, so we had to figure out how can we get this done, and that's, that was our, our path to do that. Um, and uh, let's see, that's, what was the other agency? Six, I know I forgot one in there. Welcoming Light. Welcoming, Welcoming light. light, yeah, Thank I was just going to say. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> well, that's his show, Light. Remembering Six is... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Welcoming Light was created to um, help with training and employment and furthering that uh, across our different partnerships so that all of the folks that we serve uh, needed to have more uh, employment opportunities and more training opportunities as, as well as our staff. So that was put together for that particular purpose. Now. I know that you have some of the programs that are servicing Hudson. Yes, we do. We are at Hudson Community Access. Can you give us an example of some of that, that, that right here that the local people in Hudson can look at Absolutely. and go? So well, this is them. This, this is a great opportunity for me because we have a brand new program, just started uh, in uh, July, um, six months ago, that very few people know exists, uh, and it's called Mobile Crisis Response. Uh, it's a program where if you are in a behavioral health crisis anywhere in the greater Nashua area, 24 hours a day, uh, we have a team of staff that are ready to help assist you in that crisis in a few different ways. One, we can talk to you on the phone. Two, if um, you really need to have somebody come to wherever your location is and provide you that support, we have two teams of folks that go out and um, just respond to whatever way we can to offer support, connecting folks with needed resources. And then finally, the program also has four, four um, crisis apartments that are available where folks that may be in a crisis can stay for up to seven days uh, as they work their way through that crisis. So it's a great program. Uh, and it is absolutely available to folks in Hudson. You also have a, um, you do stuff with dental as well. We do. So we have a full-time uh, complement of dental staff with three dentists and three hygienists and two dental assistants, and they provide services in our federally qualified health center on a sliding fee scale basis uh, at 45 High Street in Nashua. And a sliding fee scale means that people who really have no means could access services as, say, low as $5 for a particular visit. Um, in addition to that, we have um, dental services offered in a van. Uh, so that van can go to locations in Hudson or other parts of the state to offer its services. We have two dental operatories in the van, and uh, sometimes we also have primary care offered in the van, so we kind of call it integrated care on wheels. So we're all about uh, combining um, housing and integrated services 
That's our formula for success that, that you see on the wall that we talk about. So somebody who might be rural or lacking transportation, a shut-in, um, somebody who's not physically capable of making the journey in can still get services and things like this. Have you ever heard of stuff like this before at the, at the, at the rate that these guys are doing it? No, I, I haven't. I think, it's, I think it's amazing. Yeah. We're lucky to have that in our community. Yeah. And um, I, I'm really very passionate about the fact that I think this, that, that our community needs to support it more well, mm -hmm. as well, because it, when these are available, if you've never gone anywhere else, and I've lived all over the country, mm -hmm. and you've lived in multiple places. We're both gypsies yep. by nature. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, and y you'd never hear of these services uh, mm -hmm. in other parts of the places I've lived. They, they didn't exist, not at this level of uh, availability or things like this. Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've tried to co-locate in sort of a fortified array of different services. Most people that walk through our facility, and we want to say that to anyone listening to your broadcast that we invite you to come and have a tour. Uh, we would like to show folks around our building and show you what are all of the services that are offered there. Uh, it's a much bigger difference by seeing it up close and personal than it is um, just hearing about it here. So come on over and, and check out what it is that we do. Um, but it is, it's all about uh, the population that we typically serve are folks that um, don't have an easy time of accessing services, that they, they have to really work hard to get organized enough and get uh, everything down straight to, to how to get what it is that they really need. Now, one of the other ways that people can also um, support partnership uh, for successful living is by going to the website, which is underneath, mm -hmm. being on the mailing list to see what are the upcoming events because oh, absolutely. With, with all of those different agencies, you're having events. I was at um, the World's AIDS Day mm -hmm. memorial service that they did um, where we walked from High Street down to, to City Hall and read out a list of people who had passed on from AIDS and had a candle vigil for them uh, December 1st. We, we, we almost walked by your store. Uh, <laughs> we could have. We could have actually arranged it. She's, she's on Pearl Street, so ah, she's, yeah. Just a stone's throw away. Yeah, yeah like, like a, just a parking lot away. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I park in that parking lot, go see her, go do yoga, go visit with Peter. Uh, we must come over for a tour then. I'm going to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would we'll love that. We'll check out your shop too. Okay. <laughs> it's a deal. Uh, um, but there are, there are lots of things going on and there are lots of ways to, to support just by showing up, just by being there and to share it. I mean, so much of the world evolves around, revolves around social media these days and people being aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and so you may say, hey, you know, financially I'm struggling right now. I don't have a lot of time. Maybe my spouse and I are both working two jobs to make ends meet. And there are a lot of people in that situation yes. these days. And I don't have the time to maybe go volunteer, but you'd have the time to go join the website because you find the time to go on your Facebook right. and just reposting an event or sharing it through your Twitter account or whatever can make a difference. Absolutely. And I'll say uh, the idea you brought up about encouraging people to join our list would be most welcome to in that uh, we have a regular newsletter that's very informative. Uh, we have a great deal of uh, publicly available information uh, and training sessions held at our 45 High Street uh, location. In the last year, we've had um, open um, sort of community learning opportunities for uh, the Safe Stations program, for parents, uh, learning skills of those that are in the addiction crisis. Uh, we had a forum last month on youth homelessness. Uh, so it's a whole variety of different topics that um, are, are of significant interest to the com larger community. 
And I definitely think that, again, one of the ways that people can show support is, is to not only be aware of them, attend them if they can, but to share them. Share them. Mm -hmm. Sharing in them is so important. Letting the community know uh, what's going on and, and bringing it up and getting a higher profile. Um, I, I look at this at Partnership for Successful Living and, and its agencies as, unfortunately, one of the better kept secrets in, in the Nashua area. Mm -hmm. um, we, we plead guilty to not doing the job we need to to get uh, the world out to know that we're there. And that's, that's why we're here today, really. Yep. And, and uh, I know some things are coming up that's going to change some of that. Um, you're bringing in a nutcase to help you with some of that in the Absolutely. near future. <laughs> um, but it is so important because you guys are doing work in, in that the community needs to know about, needs to be more aware of, and can be involved at any number of different levels um, to show up and show that support. Mm -hmm. What do you see the challenges being coming up in the next year in 2018, Peter? You keep your you, you keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on. Well, certainly complexity uh, is continuing with health care. Uh, funding for health care will be an ongoing challenge as there are so many uncertainties at this point uh, that uh, we, we're just not sure, and I don't think anyone is sure as to where it will all land precisely. Um, but, you know, we, we will have some funding struggles going forward into the next year for sure. Some of our programs uh, end in their funding, and uh, we're going to try to find ways to sustain them. Um, you know, we do a lot of work with veterans. Uh, one thing that we didn't mention is that our agency was recognized by the federal government about 10 months ago as having effectively ended veteran homelessness in the greater Nashua area. And this is an accomplishment that took about 15 years to, to create, but uh, it's held and uh, we're, we're very proud of that accomplishment. And I point that out because, you know, often people hear about homelessness issues and think, oh, it's something that will uh, never be possible to change. And we point this out because it can change. You know, with the right resources and the right support, uh, you can effectively end homelessness among certain populations if you really work at it hard enough. And this was on the video that we've already seen, but I am going to highlight this because I found this so impressive, which is out of 46,000 um, veteran, homeless veteran programs in the United States, they have the one that's number 25 out of 46,000 wow. in, the, in, the, in the greater Nashua, New Hampshire area. Uh, just to clear, we were recognized as one of 25 agencies out of the 40, 25 out of the, we're one of the 25 out of the 46,000 that were uh, veteran specific organizations. Uh, we were recognized by the George Bush uh, Foundation in that purpose. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, right here, who would have thunk? Right here. Right here, who would have thunk? I asked you this when we interviewed at high on high street um we'll be playing that interview as well as part of the show um which means that this probably is going to end up being broken up into a two-part show because there was so much for us to cover here and we still have not even touched the surface plus all the stuff we had going into it um but i asked you and i'm going to ask you again is there any piece left that you would like to see partnership for successful living bring in that would further make this tree blossom? And I'm going to ask Jay first, because I know what you said. Jay, what would you see would be the perfect addition to Partnership for Successful Living um, to even bring this to even a higher level of successful living? Well, Peter has much better vision for the whole agency. I'm just a little, like a piece of a root there, running the pharmacy and a uh, little program with the integrative health. So I think it will be a good question for Peter. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Pass the buck. Okay. Oh, <laughs> so, there so we I'll go. I'll tell you what. I'll answer what I think Jay might say. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think the piece that's missing for us is being um, 
more kind of whole health in our integration approach in that we'd like to have more alternative therapies and uh, work with yoga to be more integrated across all of our different programs. We'd like to add acupuncture. We'd like to add, uh, you know, more sort of uh, diet and nutri nutrition kinds of guidance for folks. Um, you know, more stress management. Uh, those are all things that uh, could be part of a, a greater kind of a whole uh, person view of, of health care. Uh, I think we got most of the other, p p the, some of the gaps, we need to do more with vision care. It's a big issue for a lot of the folks that we serve. Um, and of course, there's always a need to develop more housing. As, as much as we have, the demand is about eight times greater than what we have for supply. And in that integrative health, I'd love to see you throw in some energy workers, mm. some massage, some herbs. herbs. <laughs> Some herbs. But that's, yeah. I think, what Peter means. Really, if we think from the system point of view, we are really taking care of very sick people. Uh, and our system is sick care system. So when we really focus on health, we really do need to integrate all the healing modalities. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity, which Peter gave me two years back. Like, okay, Jay, just come in and open the pharmacy and do whatever you can do to help the folks. And teaching yoga for intensive outpatient groups, uh, teaching that weekly class I teach. I've seen like people, when anybody tells me that can, they can self-regulate their anxiety, so instead of taking a clonopin or a Xanax, they can just say, okay, I'm doing my yoga practice, I don't need to take my medicine. Or they can sleep without taking a sleeping medication because they know the techniques, they feel empowered. I think we need to see it all over the world but for now, I think with this population, if we can have any success, that's going to change the whole healthcare spectrum. Well, if if there is a an agency or an organization that is going to bring true well care, and even the the preventative parts into this area, my money is on you guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that bringing this to the table because, you know, as I, I know that you guys are all aware of things like energy work and other modalities like that can also help people that are struggling with mental and emotional illness, with the stress of living, with homelessness, all of that, because the more that we empower the soul, the person, the individual, the more that, that they get built up to make better decisions and to participate more in their own life, the less that they're going to need sick care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've always defined healing as the process of, of making one whole, stepping into one's wholeness. Mm -hmm. And the more that you are in your wholeness, the less room there is for sickness. Mm -hmm. um, and seeing some of the visionary brilliant things that you have brought, Peter, which we thank you for. Thank you. By bringing in people like Jay and other things, the more that we can look at a true integrative system of both preventative, preventative as well as, uh, you know, healing. picking up the pieces, healing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we want to thank you both for coming. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kevin. Peter Kelleher, CEO and President uh, for Partnership for Successful Living. Uh, Jay Gupta, who is the Director of Pharmacy and Integrative Health Services at Harbor Homes, one of the agencies of Partnership for Successful Living. Uh, you've got a um, February 14th Courtyard Marriott uh, honoring the Police Chief of Nashua. F and fire, fire Chief. Fire Chief, sorry. Fire Chief of Nashua, thank you for correcting me. You don't have to edit that out. I don't mind being wrong. Um, <laughs> you know, if you don't make mistakes, you're not human. Uh, the fire chief of Nashua um, and to raise money for the safe station system, which serves people in Hudson as well as anywhere in the greater. I'm sure if somebody showed up from Portsmouth or Keene and walked into a Nashua that no one's going to say, show me your driver's license. We're not going to give you services. Um, that's not ju that's just not the way you guys are built. That is correct. 
So we thank you very much. Cheryl, what have you got coming up? Share with our audience what you've got coming up at Tangled Roots. Sure, so we have you coming in. <laughs> oh, really? So you're coming in to teach a series on tarot, uh, reading tarot cards. We have you coming in to teach a series on um, astrology. So for those who are interested in learning to read their own personal chart. Um, we also have uh, our women's group that meets around the full moon, which is um, a donation-only event where we pick a charity to donate to every month. Um, and then we have our I've, end of the I've month got, I've got a charity. book club. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> I'm working it for you, Peter. No. <laughs> Also, uh, I got a shielding class coming. Shielding class, yes, that is coming up February second. Protecting your personal energy for those empaths that are running around taking on everybody else's stuff. Uh, something Lots that of I, those. Yes, people that that don't know how how to help people without taking on the stuff as if it's their own. Mm -hmm. Something that I might want to try to talk to them about teaching over. Uh, I don't know across the parking lot from you at some point. I think that's an excellent <laughs> I idea. Few, I, I think there's a few of those over there that probably struggle with that as well. Yeah. Um, and I'm doing my Managing the Gift ADD class as well, right? That's right. About why ADD is a gift and part of the evolutionary process, broadening the bandwidth of humanity, not a disease, disorder, or disability, as any of my five books on it will tell you. Uh, <laughs> so, the, the world is where you live, and it affects you whether you would like to have it affect you or not. In that world are those people that may not have had the same benefits that you had, or life has taken those benefits away. There are people that struggle with places to live, enough food to eat, or the needed resources to live a life, uh, a good life or even just live a life instead of just survive in it. It is our job as humanity to take care of ourselves and not just take care of the I, but to take care of the we. Namaste.